with my kids, I when when they caught their first bonefish, I'm like, okay, I'll give you twenty dollars if you can touch that fish's eye. I put the fish in a cooler. Oh, I will. Like, yeah, I can't touch it. I can't, you know, because it's got that that film over it. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> which really, you know, if, if you look at their their head, it's very streamlined as well. And then also, you know, gives them like goggles when they're rooting in the mud. But you see that on the, and you see it in the keys too with the Bahamas a lot. A lot of them moving up clams, so they'll they'll actually, you know, gives them some protection there. Essentially, they have, they have goggles on. This is the Tom Rowland Podcast. Fascinating stories to amaze, encourage, and inspire you in fishing, fitness, and the outdoors. And we're brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee. I started this podcast as a way to connect with my friends, people that I admire and respect, and you. It has been a learning journey that's made me a better person, a better fisherman, a better father, and a better athlete. I'm so happy that you're on this journey with me, and I'd love to hear from you with show suggestions, guest suggestions, or questions. The best way to get a hold of me is through text. You can text 305-930-7346 for the fastest response. But if you prefer to email, you can send that to podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. That's a dedicated email address just for the show. If you like this show, you can show your support by posting about it on social media and tagging me. Text the link to a couple of friends that may also enjoy it and subscribe and leave a five-star review if you feel like I've earned it. The website is TomRollandPodcast.com, and that is where everything lives. All past shows, you can go and listen to any show. You can look up all the different shows that we've done, both the How To Tuesdays, the Full Links, and the Physical Fridays. They all live on TomRollandPodcast.com. And the social media is Tom underscore Roland, R-O-W-L-A-N-D, on Instagram. Or you can go to our big account, Saltwater underscore Experience. I hope to hear from you soon. So now, let's get on to today's show. I'm Mike Larkin. This is the Tom Rowan Podcast. All right, Mike, you're back. How are you yeah. doing, man? Good, good. You? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. All right, so this podcast, I'm gonna. I've already decided what I'm gonna title it, and it's gonna be everything you ever wanted to know about a bonefish. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know if I'll cover everything. That's some big goals there. Yeah. Well, you know a lot about bonefish. So uh, Mike was with us um, and did an outstanding episode for tarpon, kind of everything you want to know about tarpon and a lot of things that I didn't know about tarpon. Um, if you didn't catch that, uh, Mike, why don't you give us um, your credentials? How, how do you know so much about bonefish? Yeah, well, um, I was really lucky. You know, I, I uh, after, after college, I went down and worked with the uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission in the Florida Keys. I worked down there for three years. I lived down in Marathon, and that's really when I got uh, addicted to bonefish. And at that time, I was uh, looking in the grad school programs. And then um, University of Miami was starting the, the bonefish tarpon conservation program. So I applied and got in there. And I was one of two grad students, to, the first ever to be funded by, back then it was the Bonefish and Tarpon Unlimited. Now they're the Bonefish Tarpon Trust. Um, so, and then, uh, and then really from my work on bonefish and tarpon research when I was at graduate school at, at University of Miami, working on my PhD. But really my, my dissertation was doing a stock assessment of the Florida Keys bonefish fishery. So what is the status of the population? And then we'll, we'll talk today about, you know, the bonefish biology and all that. And then at the end, I could really get into the, the, um, the research results that came from that. Great. And I had to get creative with different data sets and all that, because it's not a harvest fish. So how do you get length data? I got that from tagging and, and I got some, some cat statistics some tournaments and all that. But anyway, I can get into that. So I'm really very fortunate. I got to work on bonefish for my dissertation and I, yeah. it's, and it really is my favorite fish. I mean, I got addicted to them when I lived in the Keys and I had a kayak and went out fishing for them and then just their, their speed and everything. So anyway, we went into, into the biology, but, but uh, I, know, I know I'm not alone, right? A lot of people yeah. love bonefish. Yeah. You know? Well, they're, they're really like just renowned and loved by so many people, especially fly fishermen, because they're just, I mean, really they are like the perfect fish. They, they, they do things that are super cool. So even if you're not catching them, 
you're still having this amazing experience of watching them tail or mud or, you know, doing all these things that are like a visual hunting experience. And even if you're not catching them, you're still having a, a really good time. And then they have like some serious personality to, to the fish. I mean, you can scare the crap out of them really easily, or you can kind of, (laughs) you know, not, not do that by doing things just a little bit differently, but they're, they're available all over the place, um, in, in warm waters. And that lends itself to a fish that's very popular, but, um, yeah, the bonefish, definitely one of my favorite. And I think that so many people, including Lefty Cray, I think I heard him say one time when somebody asked him, what would, if you only had one day left, what would you do? And he, he said he'd, I think he said he would wade for, for bonefish, just, you know, ankle deep wading for bonefish. And how does it get any better than that? And, 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 and hopefully I, he's doing that up in heaven right now. I hope so. <laughs> I, I think, it, I think the fish in heaven are having a, a rough time since he got there because, uh, <laughs> he, he is, he is one hell of a fisherman. Um, I had just recently had a really amazing, uh, experience in the Bahamas, uh, just, just found a flat to wade on and it was literally below ankle depth water. And these fish were, were up there and they weren't giant fish, but the the fact that they were in such incredibly shallow water and were big enough fish to, to, you know, do everything that a bonefish does. They pull a lot of drag, they tail, they're, they're doing everything, but the water was just so shallow and it was literally just, I don't know how fishing could get any better than that. Even, you know, (laughs) and, and you don't catch that many, but just, you get a lot of shots and some of them are eat and some of them don't and it's just fun so anyway i'm excited to learn uh as much as i can about the bonefish like you i really like it and uh so let's go man what w- yeah yeah i figured let's start i always like to start with the the geological record the, the fossil history okay of the bonefish and now I, I did talk about the tarpon one you know tarpon were around well tarpon ancestors were around in the jurassic period everyone knows jurassic jurassic park but 200 to 145 million years ago. But then after that is the Cretaceous period, which is 145 to 65 million years ago. And that's where the first bonefish ancestors arrived. So about 136 million years ago, the first bonefish ancestors arrived. And they had um, they had uh, large eyes, maybe not as large as tarpon. They had um, um, crushing plates um, for feeding, like bonefish have a crushing tongue, which I can get into in a bit. Um, so 136 million years ago. And where, the where, where the, is that fossil found, that, that the oldest one that we know about? Where, where would we find that? Well, a lot of them, believe it or not, Montana, that area. Really? A lot of, uh, there's a lot of, um, um, and there's reasons for that. I can't remember, like this place called the Burgess Shale, uh, Montana and Canada. And, but there's reasons why that geological record, why that area, um, why they're there. They got pushed up there or um, different climate environment. Um, but I can't remember specifics of that. Gotcha. But, um, but, um, but anyway, but I was getting back to the, um, the Cretaceous period when the first bullfish ancestors arrived. So the end of the Cretaceous period is when the big meteor hit and most life on this planet died. So those bullfish ancestors survived that. And then they went to the next period, which is a, a tertiary period, which is um, 65 to, to 1.65 million years ago. So the first, so Albiola, the fish that we fish for now in the Keys and Albiola is also the, the genus in the Seychelles and around the, the, the bonefish that we know, Albiola species, that would that arrived 65 million years ago. So it, I always you know, put in perspective, well, well, where were we? You know, well, humans didn't arrive till six million years ago. So you have a fish you're fishing for, it's been around for 65 million years. <laughs> well, we've been humans have only been around for six million years ago. So they've they have, they have a big jump on us in terms of um, the time that they've they've been here. And then, you know, you get to with, so where we, so there were, there were several different species that came and went at the bonefish ancestors. And then where are we today? There's actually, um, well, there's actually, there's eight, but it depends who you talk to. Some people could say 10 species of bonefish. They're still working out some issues with them. The Florida Keys bonefish and some deep water bonefish species that are on the planet today. But I just like to try to um, summarize it for people in the Keys and in the global audience, um, the different bonefish. So, Albia Volpe is the one we have in the Keys. That's the one that's on the, on the flat. So that's really the one that, that I focus my dissertation on, the, really the one I, I care about um, the most. I know there's a deep water species and, and um, they catch occasionally off Key West and other areas. Mm-hmm. But, um, but Albia Volpe is really the one, you, you know, the, the one that gets up to um, 16 pounds and found the 
not not that common, but fun in the Keys and um, in Bahamas and on, on the flats there. And then there's also um, I'll be all Nemoptera, which believe it or not, it's a bonefish. I've never seen one. I've seen pictures of it, but it has um, the um, the last ray, the dorsal fin is elongated, yeah. like on a tarpon. Yeah. So that I, I thought that was really really neat. So it has a similar um, a similar uh, dorsal fin to a tarpon. And then um, then there's alveol. And if you want, real quick, I could explain why they have that elongated dorsal yeah. fin. Okay. So the okay, the elongated the fin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there was a paper back in the '70s that that studied that. And what the conclusion was, um, when the when tarpon and this special bonefish, Albion nemoptera, when they're going at fast speed, it has very little drag. It's got like a T shape. It pretty much does nothing when they're going at when they're swimming at fast speeds. But at slow speeds, they can actually they can control it. They can they can dip it to the right. They can dip it to the left. And this paper described it as if you're um, canoeing. Let's say you're going canoeing slowly, and then you stick the paddle. Just stick it right in the water to the to the right. It'll cause drag if you're going down a river, and you're and you're and the canoe will kind of swerve to the right. Or if you're going to the left, you stick it straight and kind of swerve to the left. So it explains it as tarpon and this albion nemoptera bonefish. They use it as, in slow speeds to help them like move around, just to help them turn hmm. at slow speeds, and they can dip it down. And so next time you're at you're at Robbie's, watch these tarpon. You'll see them. And then they'll they'll dip it down a little bit, and then they'll swerve to the right. They'll dip it down a little bit, then they'll swerve to the left. So anyway, that was kind of, um, and I, I believe this. The paper was very well described, so I thought he did a good job explaining it. Now, it was an old paper, but isn't by, there uh, also a, a species of snook that has that? Am I am I thinking oh, that right, correctly? They're, they're, I thought there was like a long maybe, fin, a long fin snook or something like that. Maybe I'm having a bad dream, or I can't remember yeah. in my old age. But I thought that there was a species of snook that had that too. There's like the fat snook, and then there's the common snook, and then there was another one that yeah, the sword spine. Yeah, come... maybe I don't know. How did they uh, get... Maybe maybe not. Maybe I'm maybe I'm making that up. I can't remember. Anyway, okay. so <laughs> the bonefish and the that. the bonefish and the and the tarpon <laughs> definitely definitely have it. That's super cool, and and that would be something really to look at when you're when you're seeing that. And you know the tuna, the tuna has a kind of a similar thing with those little those little fins. I don't know what they call those fins that that come behind the dorsal. And when you catch a tuna and you you get it out of the water, those things are are Oops, moving like they're it's trying to use that, and it's really really cool to see that. So, yeah, very yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then they go to the other species. So like um, so Albion vulpa is in the Keys mostly in in Florida. Albion nemoptera is also found in the um the Gulf of Mexico and um, and even a little bit in the Pacific coast uh, with that with that elongated dorsal fin. And then um Albion s s I'm probably butchering these names. S Suncua is actually off San Diego. They get a small little bonefish out in the, hmm. the bays off off San Diego, California. And then Hawaii they have two species of bonefish. Um on their flats they have Albiola glossodonta um, and Albiola vergata, and but the, it's interesting in Hawaii you can tell them apart. Um, their their bottom jaw, one has a pointed jaw, one has a round jaw. Really? So it's pretty easy just to flip them over when you're in Hawaii, and um, and taking a you know seeing what species you just caught by looking at the lower jaw if you're in Hawaii. What about Christmas Island? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That? I'm getting I'm okay. getting to that. All right. Um, <laughs> so so. The, Another one is there's in the, China, the East China Sea off Korea. There's a couple of species off there, but I think they're in deep water, and I've never I've talked to anyone that's fish for them. But yeah, I'll, I'll be able to, I'll legal lepus. Yeah, that's the uh, the Seychelles, Christmas Island. Um, so that one, you know what? I can't remember if I was a rounder or pointy jaw. But I guess the point I'm trying to make is that 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 bonefish you're fishing for over there in the Seychelles, Christmas Island, it's a different species of bonefish, and it's found off also found off the southwest coast of Africa. And somebody actually, IGFA record, caught one in 19 pounds. Yeah. So it actually gets, that's bigger than LBL Volpez. Well, I, so I will real... I will go to my grave saying that the largest bonefish I've ever seen is it was in Christmas Island. And, and you're on these big, the, these big boats. They take you on a big boat with all the anglers out to the flat, and then they let you out. And you're, you're, you're pretty high above, and you're passing by these flats, and I looked down, and I saw the biggest bonefish I've ever seen, and that was back in the heyday of Isla Mirada, where we were seeing really big bonefish, you know, 16-pounders, and, and world uh -huh. record, when uh -huh. every time you would go out there, you couldn't catch them, but you'd see them, and this thing was noticeably larger, 
Um, and I, I often wondered that if it was a different species or if they got bigger is, or, yeah. or what. So yeah. that's cool. That's awesome. Yeah, different species and bigger. That's one of my bucket lists to get over there and, and fish. I, I like to get all the catch all these fish in this list, but, but <laughs> one at one at a time. Yeah. But uh, but then I, I like to go into the um, you know the uh, uh, the kind of the morphology of bonefish. They have that they have that uh, fork tail like like permanent tarpon that really lets them go fast, sustained swim, swimming speeds. They have that cylinder body shape, kind of like that very streamlined football shape. And then if you ever look closely, um, their um, their their dorsal fin and anal fin will actually will, will slide down. And their their pelvic fin has a little groove. And tuna have this too. But like if you ever watch their pelvic fin, it'll it'll go into a little groove to make it even reduce drag even more. So it's completely streamlined. Yes. There. They're kind of like a little, little slot there that they'll mm-hmm. that they'll go into. And then um, I always like to point out too, and I, I think you've talked about another podcast, but they that that adipose clear tissue over their eye, yes, which is which is like so they have they have goggles, and I've for both my kids, I when when they caught their first bonefish, I'm like, okay, I'll give you twenty dollars if you can touch that fish's eye. I put the <laughs> fish in a cooler. Oh, I well, like that. I can't touch it. I can't, you know, because it's got that that film over it. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> which really, you know, if, if you look at their their head, it's very streamlined, as well, and then also you know gives them like goggles when they're rooting in the mud. But you see that a lot in the, and you see it in the Keys too, but in the Bahamas a lot. A lot of them move now for for clams, so they'll they'll actually, you know, gives them some protection there for the mud. But it's, essentially, they have they have goggles on. Mm-hmm. And then I like to um, get into the, uh, the the mouth. So it's really kind of different. You have the tarpon, which flare up their gills and open that that huge, you know, bucket mouth. But bonefish are, are different. They they that you know that cone shaped. So for their body shape, they have a really small uh, mouth size. So they can they can flare out their gills and, and suck in food, and they can also spit stuff out really fast too. Like um, I think it was Mark Sosin's journal. If you ever, if you ever watch his show, I don't know if it's still on, but like in the opening of the episode, mm-hmm. he has a, a um he, he puts a camera and I I ran into him and asked him how he did this, but so he had, he put a, he saw a school bonefish, threw a whole bunch of shrimp around it, put the camera in the water and then left, and then came back. But anyway, if you if you watch that. You'll see it's like it's almost like a second. They can suck in that food and spit it out. Suck it in and spit it out. So so keep that in mind. And in fact, to tell you a quick funny story, my friend uh Captain Bobby Gibson in my in Miami, we were fishing one time and um he gave me this new fly. We tried it out and I was I was casting a bonefish and a bonefish came up, stopped on it, and then swam away. <laughs> and I remember going to Bobby, like, Bobby, your fly sucks, man. And I and I brought it in and I looked at it and the eyes were crushed and the hook was slightly bent. So what I didn't realize was when that bonefish came up to that fly, it swallowed it, it crushed it, and it spit it out. And I didn't even realize that. You know, yeah. it was too much, too much slack line. So I guess the point of my, making is they could really suck it in and and, and spit it out. So now I, I learned from that mistake, and you probably do the same thing, Tom. Like if I see him stop on it, I the, the hook's in their mouth. Right. It's, yeah. They come up, like I automatically start, I slide it. You know, I, if the, I don't wait for them to run off with it. Yes. You know, if they stop, it's you. In fact, they could stop and spit it out. You wouldn't even know it. So, and that's they what they're doing. They're, that's what they're doing all the time, though. I mean, they're picking up any sort of shell and crushing it and and getting what's in it and and spitting it out, whether that's a crab or whatever. I mean, they're they're doing that all day long. So it's not like, I mean, and I'm sure they pick up you know what looks like food sometimes, and it's not, and they just crush it and spit it out, and you know that's that's. Very common. That's all the time. That Mark Sosin yeah. footage was, at the time, it was the best available. Now, with the GoPro and everything, like my friend Jason Stemple, he's putting the GoPro out all the time in, in at his place in the Bahamas, and he's getting yeah. some really incredible stuff. I'll send it to you, and, and if anybody's yeah, interested yeah, 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 looking yeah. at it, you can go yeah. to Bonefish Bluff. That's the, that's, uh, that's the name of his Instagram account there, gotcha, gotcha. Bonefish Bluff. But, I mean, he's got some incredible underwater stuff and also just – just standing there um and and having a gopro or his camera and just just standing there and letting these bonefish come right up to him and seeing how they're feeding and it's it's the most incredible footage it's 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 awesome and and you see see how they feed it's just amazing (laughs) go ahead but yeah i was just going and then um yeah i talked about the mouth and then go into their go back to their eye we talked about the you know clear goggles they have so um, cause I know the tarpon one, we went in the, the colors they see and, and where they see. So I guess to, to break it down for you and I'll get into a little bit their, their life history. They, they spawn offshore. They have this eel like larvae that swims inshore. 
and then but they're their, so their vision, and the, the refresh the, the audience's memory if they haven't seen the tarpon one, but so fish have stem cells in their eyes. So they can, you know, they can change the, the colors they see. They can, um, re they can, their eyes can heal much better than ours. Because um, they need that, because a lot of them, you know, they live juveniles in one area and adults in a different area. So it can be, com can be a completely different uh, color, colors that they see, different, different water. You know, they can live in more green water, then they move offshore in more blue water, more UV light. So the, the so keep that in mind. So so bonefish, although they're what we've seen so far, their color vision doesn't change once they settle from that eel larvae. Um, but where they see changes, and they 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 determine this by looking at where are these where are these these vision cells where are they located on the eye. In fact, it is when I um provided the I got some fish from whether it's from I'm on a bonefish tournament that accidentally died, and from fishermen, I would provide eyes to this guy um, uh, Jay, uh, up in up at Florida Institute of Technology. And anyway, and I would I would mark it. He always made sure, like I I marked Scott Taylor was his name, but anyway, well, he always made sure I marked the eye um, when I gave it to him, so he knew okay what was the top of the eye, what was the bottom of the eye. But anyway, um, so when bonefish settled at the first year of their life, their vision is really, and this is really the the small. So I'm talking like a bonefish, like six eight inches. So I probably wouldn't interest your audience too much. He's a really, really small bonefish. Mm -hmm. But anyway, when they first, that first year of their life, their vision is really focused directly in front of them and directly behind them. Because keep in mind that their eyes are essentially on the side of the head. You know, they're not like in the front of their face mm -hmm. like we're, like, mm -hmm. like ours are. So they, which really makes sense. They want to look in front of them, you know, for feeding and their vision is really good behind them for predation. But then when they get to that second year of life, their, their focus of their vision changes. So it's, they lose some of that, that backward vision and it really goes to more in front of them and downward. So it's kind of like the, the, the opposite in a way of the tarpon. Like tarpon, their, their best vision is in front of them and upwards, which kind of matches up to, you know, their, their big open mm -hmm. mouth. That, mm -hmm. Whereas bonefish is the opposite. Their, their vision after their second year life and onward, it's in front of them and below them, which makes sense. You know, they're a benthic animal, you know, they feed on the bottom. So I know, so just keep that in mind, you know, they, they, their best vision is directly in front of them and, and, and below them. So I always recommend, you know, I always try to use flies with, you know, that could sink down and get, get in front of them so they can, they can see it better and get down in the bottom. That's where they have the best vision. Mm -hmm. And now to go into the, the colors they see, which I find this fascinating. So we, you know, we have our peak color vision is, is blue, green, and red. Um, and we actually see a, in a, a mix of those colors of the colors that we see. So we have like a those those three peaks, but bone bonefish have in fact bonefish have seven. Seven. Yeah, seven. Yeah. Or nine. So they well one they see they see UV light, which is a real dark dark purple that we can't see, but the other colors that they peak vision in is purple, light blue, dark green, green chartreuse. So they see green very well. They have a peak at dark green, green and chartreuse, and also and also light yellow. So they, now they don't see the far end over to the right in the color spectrum of the, the reds. Um, so they don't see red very well because red just, just fades away so fast in the in the marine environment. But would that just look green, black? Would that just look black to them? Like or or yeah yeah yeah. yeah. I mean yeah, they, exactly. they see yeah, it yeah. because there was always yeah. that that thing with the uh, with the red fishing line that they were saying it was invisible, but. I mean, the red is invisible, but it turns black, right? Like, yeah, you can yeah. Still or they see had red it. hooks too, like a blood-colored hook. Right. Like it's just, but it's just it's gonna black. look black, yeah. and not not, yeah, not it when it turn out to look invisible. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I don't, uh, yeah, I don't buy that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I know they're trying to, you know, make money and trying to, like, uh, hook fishermen, but but one, yeah, the fit. You're right. It'd be, it'd be black to them, and um, they don't have the um, the vision in that that the color range, and also you can see it too if you go diving. You know, you go underwater, you start swimming towards the bottom. That red turns to black. I mean, you can see that red just fades so fast as you, as you don't even have to go that far uh, below the surface to see that. So, the, so they really can see colors so much better than than us. So those greens, those blues, those purples, and then that that UV light. Because I mean, because the environment they're living in, that shallow water, you know, clear, you know, I call it Caribbean water, Florida Keys water, or whatever you call it. That's just like there's a ton of UV light there, and and, and the reason is and, and you know why do they why do they see that UV light? Well, and it's it's very very abundant, but you know and there's different um, beliefs in that. Some people think well you know some there's some reef fish that use UV light for communication, so maybe predators can key on that and 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 feed off them. You know can see that that special communication, 
But I think in terms of a bonefish, it's just like, you know, if you're, you know, there's a, there's a crab, you know, in, in, or I would say a, a shrimp in, in front of you. And then there's UV light everywhere except that where the shrimp is. So it mm. makes like a, a silhouette. So that's my belief that it's, it's so abundant. And then the, it helps them really see their, their prey items much better. They can even see small prey items because there's UV light everywhere except where that crab is or that, that shrimp is. And so it helps them really key in on, on, on prey. So that's why I believe that they, they see that UV light. Mm. Interesting. But you know, uh, um, uh, do you know Mitch Howe is from yeah. the Florida oh, yeah, Keys? Sure. So, so he, years ago, uh, yeah, I still go to these tournaments and see him do real well. And then, um, uh, I guess, so what do you catch it on? I caught him on jigs. And of course, you he did. He gave me, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, a, <laughs> he's the like one that taught master. me how to jig for bonefish. He, he, yeah, he, he absolutely really? did. He booked me for a couple of the tournaments, including the uh, the Little Palm Island tournament, and. And I always knew he was good at it, but man, we got to this flat and he's like, well, let me, let me just see what I can do here. And he pulls out this jig and I was like, okay, let's see what this is all about. And he just starts blind casting. He's like, yeah, you know, this is good for two or three fish a day. And I was like, really? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I got my, my sight casting rod here and I just throw this jig and he showed me how he did it. And damn, if it didn't work, it worked so good. And he was really yeah, good yeah. at it. He had so much confidence in it, which was a big big thing like most people would try it for a few minutes and stop but he would try it all day and he would cast anytime we couldn't see or if there was a there was an area where we could see really well that a oh, fish was going to show up very obviously he'd be casting directly into the sun and where we couldn't see and he would catch fish there and those fish that's what it takes to win one of those tournaments is one fish like that that you didn't expect and you wouldn't have caught otherwise yeah, yeah, and yeah. and he has done so well with that over the years he's he's a remarkable fisherman and and really that's the that's what he's the best at in my opinion well he gave me some some jigs years ago and they were pink mm. and i just say and that's a, I was like well that's what that's what mitch uses so that's what i gotta use and <laughs> i i used them for years in fact my son caught his first bonefish on one of the jigs that that i got from from Mitch, but then well, when I saw this this result came out, this research was also like pink is really like gray to them. I mean, it's it's they don't see that that red color, that light red color like pink. So I, I guess some what I didn't realize, you know, there's obviously you know bouncing off the bottom, there's a movement, there's a lateral line, they can hear it, you know, they can they can see the movement. So I guess I was so fixated on I gotta use pink, I gotta use pink. But then when I saw this data, I think it's more an issue I think of getting the the jig in front of them and mm. and bouncing it, but. But I do, but I still I got I still appreciate that he gave me some jigs though. Yeah. I still use them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you do. <laughs> but um, but then I guess to move on to the um, briefly talked about it, but the um, life history of bonefish. So they they spawn offshore. We always kind of knew that because some of the early research on their their larvae, that that leptocephalus larvae, we knew that they're they have different stages. But that first stage, some of the research find out, you know, they can't osmoregulate. They can't deal with changes in salinity. They can in the, the second and third stage as they develop that, that leptocephalus goes to different stages of development. But when they first hatch from the egg, they need to be in really stable salinity waters. Like if they're in Biscayne Bay or Florida Bay, if they, if they spawn out there and the tide changes, salinity would change. They would either shrink or explode because they can't really osmoregulate very well. Mm. So we knew that they spawned offshore. But but one of the funny things were um, d discovering this was back in the early 2000s. So I was doing um, a bonefish a telemetry study. So essentially, um, you put a tag in a fish that gives off a pinging noise, and then you put these little devices around Biscayne Bay that listen for that specific tag. So if the swish, I'm sorry, the fish swims by it, you know, um, okay, and, and, and tag has a distinct um, code on it too. So like, okay, fish one swim by here, fish two swim by here. You see, you know, when it moved it, where was the receiver that detected it, and what fish moved by there, what date, and everything. So anyway, we're we were doing that, and, but you know, it's a lot of work. These the equipment is expensive going out and downloading them. So we joined with a, a, a mangrove snapper project at University of Miami. I was doing a very similar study. So I wanted to put all my receivers on the flats around Biscayne Bay. They wanted to put all theirs on the reef. So, so I tagged a bunch of bonefish, put this, and there's actually, um, if you go to YouTube, you can watch a, a video of me if you want to see how it's done. And there's probably actually many more people do this research nowadays, but how you cut it open and you put an incision in it, you make an incision and then you, you sew it up. It looks, it looks brutal, but you know, a little sidetrack. I, we have some, an aquaculture facility at University of Miami and started tagging them. And I was like, well, you know, if, 
if the fish dies, everyone loses, right? I mean, you get no data, you just kill the fish, you waste the tag. So I practiced at um, the aquaculture facilities, big tanks at University of Miami. And believe it or not, when you sew them up and you release them in that tank, they're feeding the next day. Hmm. So it just blew me away that these fish were surviving. And next day they're feeding. They're back to feeding shrimp in their schools and everything. That's cool. But so if somebody wanted to watch that video, where would they go exactly? To, to your channel? To or to just YouTube look up? and um, Larkin Bonefish. Okay. And so L-A-R-K-N, my last name, Larkin Bonefish. And there may be a few other things. I think your saltwater experiences on there when I did an episode oh, of you yeah. guys years ago. But but anyway, if, I think, it, you know, being the, first, the top five, I think it was um, a waterways episode. Um but anyway, so we were doing this project with the um, with the the mangrove snapper people, and we you know, were downloading it, and you know I'm tagging fish and all that, and then we we're downloading, and I went, remember I went out, I downloaded a bunch of their receivers out in the reef off LA Key, like oh yes, yeah, so I got a bunch of snapper, you know, data. So I go back, I'm like, and then you woke up the number, like oh zero zero two, oh that's a bonefish. So anyway, it was just interesting that we didn't, I mean we knew they moved offshore. But it was like the really first time we could document, you know, they're moving offshore to spawn. And they do that at night, too, which is mm. interesting. That's so nice. when you, you know, they, and it's really fast. It's within 24 hours. So, you know, they're moving around the, the bay. And um, we track these fish going up and down LA Key in the wintertime and going down. And they, they went south. I'm not, we didn't have receivers down there at the time, but I would guarantee they went down to Alvarado and other areas. But anyway, we certainly, certainly tracked them moving offshore to spawn off, off LA Key. So, so anyway, so they'll, they'll spawn, they'll move offshore right past the, um, the reef crest. You get, you know, that, that Gulf Stream clear water coming in there, that, that um, offshore water. So they'll, they'll spawn off there. And, um, and they actually have um, about a, a, the ones in Florida that I, I also got some, some juveniles and I age them. They, they actually have a 40 day uh, life cycle. So I, I think there is some retention of the spawning in the Keys. And, you know, we know that they spawn off LA Key, but, I'm sure there's many more in the Keys. Like, I definitely think there's one off Alvarado somewhere, spawning irrigation. I wouldn't be surprised if there was one in the lower Keys. Um, but, you know, the the 40-day life cycle, they're, the one thing they're pursuing now is, you know, are these fish coming from um, Cuba as well? So that could be an issue. And, and we did a study with a permit. permit. So bonefish in Florida, we found have a 40-day life cycle. So I'm sorry. So meaning before they, they hatch and they settle, and in uh, on the beaches, and it looks like um, we're still trying to figure out the Florida Keys where they're settling. But it looks like they may be back in in Florida Bay. But that that duration between when they hatch from the egg and when they settle as juvenile bonefish is about 40 days, whereas a uh, hermit it's about about 30 days. And we did a study on that. We found that uh, dried tortugas is a big spawning aggregation mm. from hermit, mm. and then they'll settle they'll settle in the Keys. So so the fact that it's 10 days longer does open up the opportunity that they could be coming from from other areas like Cuba. And as well, and um, the big interesting one in, in Florida, which I know you've been in the Keys a long time, but you know, uh, the sidetrack, but um, lobster actually have a nine month larval cycle. So they come from way down from Brazil. So anyway, you have such a large, um, cause when you have these long, you know, these long um, larval, um, larval life sta stages, you know, they gives them the opportunity to come from other areas and drift in the current and then- So then would, would some of the, I mean, uh, this is probably a difficult, question to answer but some of the florida lobsters would come from florida and the keys and stuff but you're saying that other or or at least some are also coming from as far away as brazil because of that cycle? yeah majority of them yeah wow yeah 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 so that's yeah, what's yeah. that's what's kind of scary is when you when you when we you know we're, we're working towards conservation of these fish and and things and then you find out that there are there are things going on that might be out of our control like what's going on in brazil how do we control what their water quality is or how what they're doing um that could affect in fact our have, lobster. A, have a yeah, massive yeah. impact on the lobster or the bonefish or the tarpon or the permit or or whatever and uh that's what's cool about learning more and more because you know that's where like if you <clears> can <throat> change it at the source or or somehow convince that country that um you know they should be watching out for this since in their economic uh, advantage to do so, then that's where some huge change comes in. Yeah, yeah, we ran an issue with tarpon. Well, we certainly did the, the tar tarpon tag in Texas. They go down to Mexico, mm -hmm. so you know they cross that that border. You know, yeah. and they not as much catch and release in Mexico as there is in Texas. I bet, I bet <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but but uh, um, it, it's still interesting about the you know we're still learning about the life history. In fact, I still feel like we didn't really know in the Florida Keys where the bulk 
of these alveolar vulpes where they're where they're settling. I did a lot of work on Key Biscayne because it was really close to me when I was living in Miami and I sang year round. I did find juvenile bonefish recruiting to to the beaches of Key Biscayne. But I think that there, um, and there's also been some some netting in, um, they put a channel net and look for larvae in the Florida Keys. Like I think it was actually Channel 5 Bridge years ago. But anyway, they, they caught some bonefish, but not not the numbers you would expect. But but that's, so I think that it looks, it's the kind of, it, there's a lot more work to be done there. But I think um, people are talking about now, maybe back in like Blackwater Sound and back in Flamingo, they could set on there. And to tell you a quick story, we're doing it, we'll probably get in a bit, but that, you know, that big 2010 cold kill, mm -hmm. um, you know, that big giant freeze, all those fish were, were dying. And my phone is ringing off the hook and I really got to thank it was some great, you know, Frankie Ortiz went out and collected a whole bunch of bonefish and Juan Valdez collected a whole bunch for me. But, um, you know, my phone is ringing off the hook about this dead bonefish here and there. But one of the phone calls like Blackwater Sound, I'm like, what? Blackwater Sound? Like, hmm. okay, sure. And I drove down there and sure enough, there were dead bonefish on the beaches and there were some that were still alive that were still like they were circling, like they were they were dying from the cold. And um, unfortunately, they, they didn't didn't make it. But um, but anyway, it was like, um, but anyway, it was interesting that I'm like, I didn't think there would be any juvenile bonefish back in, back in Blackwater Sound. Now, those ones that you're finding, how big were they? Like you're calling them juveniles. Like Yeah, yeah. So like, like 12 inches, a foot or less. Wow. So really a foot. Wow. Or now Blackwater yeah. Sound for people that don't know much about that area um, that's an area that doesn't have a lot of tide is that correct um, yeah maybe not as strong as as, um, as other areas you know actually you know I never really thought about that Tom to be honest with you I never really thought about well, we it. fished we fished way up in Key Largo um, one time and, and where, where we were fishing um, it there was basically no tide it was either wind or barometric pressure that affected the everything up in there and it's it's uh i've only fished up there a few times but it's it's strange to fish up there with without a lot of without much tide it's it's strange but i wonder how that would affect those juvenile bonefish if that's part of the reason maybe that they were up there or it's just all water quality or yeah or yeah, what yeah, they're yeah. eating yeah. or i don't know you learn a little bit more each yeah. each one of these things you know yeah yeah and there's definitely more work to be done in that area but um and then to move on to the, uh, I was going to talk about the the aging. So um, now the females are bigger than the males, but it's not a clear shift like you saw in tarpon. Like tarpon, it's so rare to find a male greater than 100 pounds, whereas the females are, you know, slightly bigger, statistically larger than the males. But there's actually um, um, there's quite a range of the males. In fact, if you want, I could I have a, um, a slide I could sure. show you. Sure. Put it up there. You want me to... All right. Let me. Um... Let me share my screen here. And then just bear with me for a second. Are you seeing it now? Yeah. Bonefish growth. So, yeah. So the top one, so both of them, the X axis is the age. Um, and then the, 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 the Y axis on the top one is fork length in inches. The Y axis in the bottom one is weight in pounds. So the, the blue is all males. The green is all female, so you can see, you know, uh, on the average, the the males are, are smaller than the females, but it's not. But there is a, you can see, so the the line is just the best fit for that data. So, but keep in mind, there's a lot of variation. You can see kind of like the the shotgun spread for each each age there. Mm -hmm. So, but we age one up to um up to uh um twenty one years. Twenty one years is is wow. the maximum so, age. So for those that aren't looking at this this thing, the the one that I'm looking at that looked like it might be 21 years old would be uh, 21 years old. It would be close to 30 inches long. Um, so if you catch a 30 inch bonefish, it could be over 20 20 inches yeah. long, right? And the same thing yeah. is true for the uh, which the 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 weight in pounds and the length. Yeah, that's yeah. It's close. It's hard to fall in a figure. It actually was 28. I looked it up yesterday. It was 28 and a half inches. I mean, it's kind of maybe hard to follow this figure. Is, that, there were is some... that fork length? Yeah, yeah, fork yeah. length, fork length. Yeah, yeah. So and that was um. So there is a range. Like typically, fish have indeterminate growth. So the longer the fish, the the older. But there is also um quite a quite a there is also some variability. Yeah. Like there that... was a I ate them up to 29 inches, and they were they were teenagers. Really, and what's interesting was... about these two graphs is the majority of the fish that that you have here are between maybe four and 11 years old maybe on both of these graphs and 
But do you think that that data is because that's the size of fish that people catch all the time, or uh, you just had more samples of that, or do you think that like that? Uh, I, I guess a, a larger fish becomes rarer and rarer and rarer. That's why they're a trophy, right? Like, except yeah, in yeah. the case of Isla Morada, where there were tons of big ones, it, it, it were they were just really hard to catch. Um, but it seems like you're for right, the most right. part, if you're getting if you're catching a fish that's around five or six pounds, even up to eight. That fish could be anywhere between four and and ten years old. But you're right in the fishery. You're right. There, there there is that big cluster of of fish there from four to to about twelve years old. Because you're right. That is what the majority of the fish in the fishery. That's what they're catching. Mm-hmm. That's yeah, interesting because that's, that's almost one of the first questions that you know a client or anybody will ask you. It's like how long how old do you think that fish is? And you know you know for tarpon it's like man, it's really old. It could be older than you. And, and then for bonefish, I never know what to say. And I've always kind of thought that a lot of these fish will grow very quickly to maybe, uh, you know, they're, you know, two pounds or something like that. And then the growth would slow down, but I don't know. Um, it doesn't. No, you're right. It does. Once they, yeah, once they get to about three or five years, you're right. It kind of slows down. It kind of like, forms, not to get too technical, but it kind of forms like an asymptote as if there was like a wind. Like it, you're right. It kind of, peaks and then it kind of levels off a bit it still grows but it still goes up you kind of follow those lines there mm-hmm. but it's kind of leveling off as you get into those those older older fish but um but you know that that 21 year old one was interesting because we before that was a study had about 19 years and then it was um 21 and actually mark croco gave me that that fish i remember i i called him and harassed him i told him he killed papa smurf man because that was like <laughs> that was like the oldest fish you know the oldest we've ever you know to this day you know that's the oldest bonefish we've ever aged before well it's now, no maybe surprise that mark croker caught that <laughs> but, yeah, you know, i told uh, you i was i told you i was going to get the granddad <laughs> yeah 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 but you know maybe maybe somebody will age um, um a seychelles bonefish and find it to be even even bigger um but that's where we are you know that's currently right now that's the oldest but most of them you're right most of the bonefish you catch are like that four to 12 year old um age range there you know i was going to Stop, stop sharing that there but but now if you want to get into um uh well i guess before we're going to go in it real quick but talk about the the feeding so one thing i also want to point out the florida keys bonefish um so there there was a really intensive diet study back in the 90s on, on florida keys bonefish mm. so and they really they have a different uh diet than, than the other areas so like in the bahamas they really eat clams and crabs clams and crabs puerto rico clams and crabs so in the Florida Keys, though, what's interesting is when they're about 17 inches fork length or smaller, they, they eat mostly shrimp and some, some small crabs. But when they get beyond that 17 inches, their diet shifts. They, they go to xanthid crabs, like more like the stone crabs, mm-hmm. and they start eating toadfish. Yeah. So, so they start eating, eating fish, and toadfish is a really common, one of, the, one of the dominant prey items for them. And I think the reason they just don't eat it when they're smaller is just you know, they're just so gap, gap limited. Like their mouth is so small. So you look like, you know, a 15 inch bonefish that, you know, they don't have, you know, um, they don't have, uh, you know, like a, like a barracuda. They're not got to chop off a, right. a chunk. They got to suck it in. They got to, it's like, you know, you're trying to eat like a volleyball, right? I mean, mm-hmm. they can't fit it in, but once they get older, they switch over to toadfish. And that's really, and there's, there's a lot of, um, uh, examples in the literature, both agriculture and in, in out in the wild, where when fish switch diets from invertebrates, for meaning like crabs, and then they switch over to fish, that their growth rate goes up. Mm-hmm. So, and I really think that's really one of the primary reasons that they get so big. In fact, if you look at, um, I'm trying to remember the, um, I think I have it here. To give you an example, like a 10 year old bonefish in the Florida Keys is about 26 inches fork length. That's, that's a big fish. Whereas the, the same, you get in the Bahamas, that's only about a, a 20 inch fork length. Hmm. So you know, that's six inch difference. So they, they, and it's only about maybe you're looking at a four pounder versus like a 10 pounder. Now, what do we so, know? What do we know about the, the, the habitat of a toadfish? What's good toadfish habitat? Is it turtle grass? Turtle grass or more. They, they hang out in those, um, those algae clumps, like in the huh. bottom, like, so they actually hide in there. So and I, in fact, I because I used to um, I use them for bait. I, you know, I never really had a lot of luck with them. You, I mean, the bonefish weeded, um, but anyway, um, 
if you look in those like you go along in those, those algae clumps and you use net one up there's a good chance you can find one they're, they're hiding in there hmm. you know during the day interesting so i, I just i you know, always had them on the boat but uh, i mean obviously they eat a lot of them you know, like the dye content but it's just like i feel like that shrimp gives off that smell right yeah. Where i'd get them to eat you know your this toadfish it looks like a tadpole and I feel like they just like you got to get to move it in front of them. Or I feel like if I put a shrimp out there, they'll you know they'll smell it right away. But those toadfish, it seems like I, I have to put it like in a, a sandy area where they can see it. So they may not make the best bait, but there's a lot of um, and this is not new, but a lot yeah. of flies in them. Well, I was just wondering like if 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 turtle grass or that area that as the, those algae clumps are really good toadfish habitat. And, you know, I haven't fished all the Bahamas, but I've fished over there a good bit. And you have a lot more sandy bottom. You have a lot of hmm, areas that, that, you know, coming from the Florida Keys, we're like, oh, man, this is awesome. You can see the fish forever away. It's beautiful white sand. It's sparse grass versus, like, this lush mm -hmm. turtle grass that we have in the, in the Florida Keys. And maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe that just doesn't support a lot of, of toadfish. Um, in, in that type of of habitat i don't know i don't know much about the toadfish but um... yeah in fact, i don't even think they're even there the, the um if you look at like a food web of like all the different prey items for example like all the different prey items the bonefish could eat like bahamas is really limited they have a very narrow food web i mean you're basically looking at you know islands in the middle of the gulf stream so they do have um you know they have primary productivity and all that stuff but not at the level like we get in florida bay and mm -hmm. and so we have a much more diverse food yeah. web. Now, when you're when you're um, studying the 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 things that bonefish eat, are you sampling stomach content as well as kind of saning the grass and the and the flats and stuff like that, and seeing what you kind of come up with? Uh, is that how you're you're de you're determining like what the what the spectrum of things that they might eat are by by the saning and sampling yeah, yeah, really. of the turtle grass or or the bottom? Yeah, yeah. Both from both from seining to get the smaller ones, and then from from hook and line, you know, from from the bigger ones. Huh. So when you you kind of like you kind of maximize your your data you get from the fish, you get the the age, the sex, um, the gut contents, uh, the gonad, um, whether you know the spawning condition is it getting ready to spawn or is it just uh, doing nothing ready to spawn? You know, are the gonads small, have they started to grow and hydrate, or so you get a lot of data from. There's, I feel like there's like I don't know, like maybe. You know, essentially, from a dead bonefish, you could run five or six different projects just mm. from that, yeah. uh, different data points just from that yeah. fish. So, would you have have you um, come across any worms that live on the flat? Because um, the reason I ask is because I I developed this fly and it's like the simplest fly in the world, but it most closely would resemble what I would think is a worm. But I've never seen anything in the water that looks like it, and I just kind of tied this fly up on the spur of the moment thought it looked okay and throw it out there and the bonefish seemed to really like it and it's kind of a bright <laughs> green color um i also tie one in pink interesting that you say that they don't see that very well but maybe that looks gray to them but this is kind of about a about a two to three inch worm and i'm wondering if i mean they love this fly it's probably my best fly but I've never seen anything that looks like, I mean, you look down, you see crabs, you see shrimp, you see stuff like that when you're sampling the, the grass, but I've never seen anything that looks like this fly, but yet the bonefish seem to really like it. And I'm wondering if that's just, if it's looking like something else to them, or if you are finding any sort of worm. Yeah, there. yeah, yeah. There, I can't remember the, the, the name of it, but there are some tube worms that they do eat, that they mm -hmm. root out and, and eat. So I've seen them a lot of, especially up in Biscayne Bay, I saw a lot of those tube worms. What color so, are they? Um, they were white, white. The ones that I yeah oh. found in their in their stomach. And then oh, they I like them also... green. <laughs> they like them green. I promise you that. They like them in the Bahamas too. Okay, good. And Christmas good Island, know. they all like this fly. <laughs> but I also wonder, you know, like um, the you know, we get so caught up in the color, but you know, being able putting in front of them, you know, yes. and moving it, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot to the. Um, to enticing a strike than just the color, right? Yeah, and when I'm watching <laughs> these videos that Jason Stemple's getting, um, and they're very close, either right, you know, I mean, he's just right on top of these fish, and he's just standing super still for a long time, and they're rooting around, and they are basically, it looks like they're kind of going down in there and rooting around before they're even seeing anything, and if anything were to move, they would jump on it, and and uh, <laughs> it, but they're but they're not feeding like super aggressively they are really 
grazing more like you would think of a of a sheep or or you know an animal that's moving very slowly and just got their head down and just just sampling stuff some of its food some of it's not they they spit out what's not they eat what is then they kind of pick their head up and there's a little mud cloud coming off but it's not what I would have had, had assumed before that they're actively feeding and looking for something moving uh -huh. and they're just kind of grazing along in these, in these videos and I'll send them to you. And again, you can see yeah, them on yeah, Jason yeah. Stemple's yeah. uh, Instagram. It's at uh, bonefish bluff for the people that are listening. And okay. there's, there's quite a few of the videos there. I posted some on my Instagram account too of his, uh, of these bonefish feeding. And it's really super, super cool, but it's different behavior because the fish are so relaxed and nothing's bothering them and just how slowly they're feeding is a is a surprise because even when you see them tailing you're expecting that they're like just rooting around all the time but they're they're yeah. they're really you know feeding much slower than you know what was being played in my mind before i had been able to okay. see them from this angle it was kind of cool i think you'll i think you'll like yeah yeah videos. yeah i do look, look all right so that. getting back to the to the diet yeah, so really, I guess uh, this interesting that they, they eat those toadfish, and um, and really that causes that that jump and that you know the growth, and you see the difference between um, you know here in Bahamas, you know you look at fish very similar latitude, you know, but they're they're just much bigger. Their growth is much higher growth rate in the, in the Bahamas, and uh, I'm sorry, in the Florida Keys compared to the Bahamas. So so that switch from that fish really helps. You yeah. Know, fish diet. So while we're talking about what they eat and stuff like that. What, how how what do we know about the the scent, the how how a bonefish smells? How can you um, study that? Because of of all the fish, I mean, tarpon will definitely come to chum. They they definitely do. Um, sharks come to chum. Bonefish come to chum. You, it, permit will come also, but not as frequently as as the bonefish. Um, but there are just some fish, you know, a bonnet shark is one that'll come right into the to some shrimp. But bonefish tend to, it, it seems like they have a really good sniffer. Smell. Uh, yeah. yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. and, and yeah. so what do you know about that? And what kind of data have we been able to determine about their ability to smell maybe different than other fish's ability to smell? Yeah, that's that. That's something I always wanted to pursue. In fact, you can, you, there's some literature where they, you know, they look at the brain and they can analyze the the brain of a fish and determine okay this one is primary a sight feeder this mm. one is primary a, a a smell you know depends wow. on, on smell so we never had that i never i talked to a couple scientists at conferences but i never pursued that because i always wanted to see that analysis done for bonefish because i only had brains bonefish brains in front of me from doing the otolith work the aging growth work and so forth so but i i, I totally agree with you i think if we is my so i don't know what that results would be but i think it would definitely be um, strong. I would even maybe say, I don't know if you would smelling would be greater than vision, but they're definitely vision predators. Mm -hmm. But it'd be it'd be right up with them. Like they definitely have a small, strong, you know, smelling scent, and and you know, they find that shrimp down in that grass when you cast them, or you know, they respond to chum, as you're saying. Yeah. So I definitely think they have a strong. Some fish, scent. you know, it's so obvious. Like especially sharks. I mean, you can even have like a a lemon shark or a nurse shark or or even a tiger shark, I mean, they really come in to the scent way more. And you could throw a lure way out in front of them, and they're not going to see it. But a black tip shark kind of does both. They are, I mean, when we're, when we're dredging in these channels for tarpon, you'll have a black tip that'll eat a fly that's perfect for tarpon, oh, wow. right? And it's, it's, I mean, that happens quite a bit. You come tight, and, and it runs, and it takes off, and it seems like a tarpon, and it even jumps out of the water, and you're like, ah, oh, black tip you know, and it's not what you want, or you bring the lure, you, you, the leader back and it's, it's all frayed. But the black tip is one that, um, that is a sight feeder and a scent feeder. And then it seems like the, the lemon shark is really not reliant on its vision much at all. I mean, it, it's more of a, That's of a scent thing. And then, then I think a lateral line thing, because when you get the, when you get the fly in front of the shark, if you move it too quickly, they, they're just like, eh, well, it's gone. Um, where a black tip will accelerate and, and get it because they can actually see it. And a bonefish um, seems like it's both. It's, it's got very good vision if you, were, if you have your presentation within this cone of vision like you were talking about before. But if it's not, 
they don't see it. I mean, they just don't see it. Like if it's too far out in front of them or too far off to one side yeah, or another, yeah, yeah. they don't yeah. see it. But they might smell it, and they might lift their head up and then move over there, and and it, they'll they'll eat it motionless off the bottom. Um, and that's how people have caught millions of bonefish, you know, in chum lines, right? You throw a little piece of shrimp out there, you wait, and you're not moving it, you're not giving it any action, you're not imparting anything to it, and all of a sudden it's tight and you're, you know, you got, and that's how you catch some really big ones as well. Yeah. I mean, that is, yeah, that's my biggest bonefish ever chumming. Absolutely. I mean, that's a, yeah. that's a tried and true method. And, and it's happened, it happens so much that there's zero doubt that a bonefish has a really good smell uh you know or, or capability of smelling but uh, it's interesting to see that you would you would go directly to the brain to determine you and so in in doing that you would be able to tell that there would be certain parts of the brain that would be more active or more developed than than other parts and that would be associated yeah. with yeah, the yeah. nose that's yeah. fascinating yeah 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 yeah, yeah and obviously i've done for both and, and a whole bunch of other species but um, you know, I brought up a point that I, I forgot to make since we've gone back to vision here. So, so you were talking about tarpon. They have they're excellent nighttime visitor vision. Um, they have a lot of cone cells, whereas bonefish have horrible nighttime vision. <laughs> I'm not saying that they don't feed at night. They may, you know, feed off smell and other ways, but they don't have the cone cells like a like a tarpon does. So, in fact, there's a funny. Um, if you ever go to Bear Cut, I don't recommend it because I. Once somebody called the police on me one time fishing off the Bear Cut Bridge. But <laughs> but anyway, at Bear Cut Bridge, believe it or not, if you go there in the summertime, you know, you woke up, there's a there's a flat there in the edge, which has a lot of light there. And you can actually see bonefish there feeding in the light. They're directly in the light. But then you go 30 feet to the right, and there's tarpon there, and they're directly in the shadow. You can just see that, you know, just it points out, you know, you have a tarpon that sees much better in the dark. They have excellent nighttime vision. And then the bonefish, he needs that light to feed off night. Wow. So, and you, so um, you're seeing those bonefish feeding directly under the light off yeah, that bridge. Yeah, That's bizarre. Yeah. I've never seen that before. That's yeah. fantastic. Because, I mean, even at all the dock lights and stuff like that, like at Hawks K or Robbie's or whatever, you see tarpon, you see snook, you'll see Jack Cravell's uh, look downs and things like that that are around the dock. But I don't think that I've ever seen a, a bonefish under a light like that. That's super cool. Yeah, yeah, it's and it, it, it's really powerful light, and it covers like a whole uh, grass flat there, and some algae and all that, so you can you can see them. And I, I caught one there, but then someone called the police on me because you got to fish from the bridge. So I don't recommend going. You go there to look, but don't have a fishing rod because people call the cops on you. And I didn't get arrested, but I thought I was going to get arrested. But um, so I don't recommend going there except to look. Don't fish. Okay. But um, but now I think I was going to go into the um the tagging. So um, the tagging was a great data set because. You know, bonefish are primarily since since the late 70s, they've been primarily catch and release. So you don't know, um, you really need to have that catch data to look at what are the size of fish. And then from that length data, you can associate an age and you can look at the age of the fish and estimate mortality, as well as tagging also gives the movement of the fish and, and, and growth too, where how much, you know, what was the size, the weight and length when it was tagged when it was and then what was the uh, the length and weight when those were captured. So I got to get involved with them. That um, not I'm not just not trying to brag, but it was the first ever successful bonefish tagging project. There was one in the Keys that back in the late '70s and early '80s, but they didn't have any recaptures. And I think tags just got better, and they they only tagged I think like 130 fish. So this one in the in the Florida Keys, it was we tagged 8,000 bonefish. Wow! And had over and had over 300 recaptures. So I had a lot of data to work with. So just to just to summarize all those 8,000 fish and 300 recaptures. So 40% of those 300 recaptures, 40% of those were recaptured in the same exact flat where they originally tagged. <laughs> 40%. So I always like tell people, 40%, 40%. Wow. So um, so if you if you catch a bonefish in a flat, I would come back to that flat again yeah. and again. Like I mean, <laughs> that's where they are. You, you got something there. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So keep that in mind. I mean, the tagging proves that 40% were the same exact – one of them was the next day in the same flat. One of them was tagged and recaptured by someone else in the same exact flat one day later. Um, and then 50% of those were captured. So now I'm going a little bit higher. 50% of those 300 recaptures were tagged within two miles of where it was originally tagged. So so they kind of – so if you find a flat with bonefish, you don't need to go that far. You know, usually there's other – unless there's no flats nearby. But so if you, so if you, you find a flat historically out of bonefish, then check other nearby flats 
you know, if you caught one in one flat, check out the nearby flats because 50% of those were captured was within two miles of where they were tagged. Now there's a told another dimension to this. So 10% of those were captures were 15 miles from where they were captured. So, so bonefish, even they have a strong, what's called strong sight fidelity. I mean, they come back to the same flat over and over and over again. Now they will take a break from it, but they will come back to it. But that doesn't mean, you know, they're not just hanging out in that flat, right? They're coming through, they're feeding and they're moving. So they're actually home range is huge. In fact, to estimate the home range of a bonefish, you have to track it continuously. And there's been many attempts at this. You know, they, they put tags in a giant array, but they come through and then they leave. Like if you want to look at home range of a red grouper, it's pretty easy. Just put a couple receivers on a, on a reef and they stay there. Whereas a bonefish, you put them around a flat, they come to that flat, but then they leave, go to a different flat. So they can really move quite a, quite a distance. And then, you know, we had two of the recaptures. One was an Amarada, it was tagged an Amarada, Captain Kenny Knudsen, and then Joe Gonzalez tagged one off Key Biscayne. Two of them got recaptured in Andros Island in wow. the Bahamas. So these two fish traveled 180 miles. They crossed the Gulf Stream to go from, from, you know, from the Florida Keys over to the Bahamas. And I used to joke, well, you know, people always say, I'm not really, a, I'm not a marlin fisherman, but they say, bonefish are great bait. Well, after getting that, you know, that tag result, I'm like, well, maybe they eat them, you know, maybe <laughs> they see them, you know. And I looked into it too, like, um, they're not on the bottom. Like that, I looked at a cross section of the temperature of the Gulf Stream and it's freezing on the bottom. So they're up in the water column and I don't think they're doing it alone. I think they're probably going into school. Hmm. But anyway, we know at least two of them were, were that they were tagged in, in the Florida Keys or were captured in the Bahamas. And take a quick story, when that first came out, I got a lot of heat from that. A lot of my um, grad students were like, no way, no way, they're lying. Like, no, I mean, I got the guys passport the guys i caught in the bahamas you know i one of them i actually knew charlie freeman you know he went over there and, and recaptured it but then they started tagging after this project was up and running getting results they started tagging bonefish in the hawaiian islands and then they started seeing bonefish move between the hawaiian islands over there so it just further illustrates that bonefish were able to make these long distance movements over very very deep water that's super cool that's super cool yeah, it was funny. Like, I, in fact, I didn't believe. It. I sat. On, I literally sat up for a week. I didn't even tell my advisor. I'm like, this guy's telling me there's a tag. You know, it was in Andros Island. A tagged bonefish. Like, I don't know. Is it true? And I kept like, can I see your passport? Can I? This guy Brian Harris. I think he's over in Sarasota. But I, I must have called him ten times. Like, what about this? Like, uh, tell me more about yourself. Who are you? What are we doing? Yeah, you know, I just wanted to, because I knew like it was going to be like okay, a, a game changer. You know, bring it up like. And I think there was there was also um, there was another third one, but the person they wrote down the um, the phone number. There's a one eight hundred number on the tag, but they didn't write the tag number. So I'm like, well, I can't um, verify it. And then since then, they started tagging um, bonefish in the, in the Bahamas. So, but I think there was I think there's more. I mean, these are just two, but I certainly think there's there's more. That's so, super cool. Now you want to get into. Um, so what I have now, I guess we can start in again, um, uh, bonefish stock status and some of the more. Um... So uh, for my dissertation, I used a lot of different models to evaluate stock status. But one of them, and I can go into results in a little bit, but um, one of them was looking at catch rates. And you can analyze catch rates. And, and then if you can isolate the, um, the, the variables that are significant to those catch rates and then remove them mathematically, um, you can really look at a trend in, uh, it's called a catch pecuin effort a CPUE index, which is reflects the, um, the abundance of the population. And that's kind of like a, a standard principle in fishery science. But before I get into that, I want to talk about what I analyzed and what were the variables that were significant. So I got really lucky that, um, so in Alvarado, there were, there was, and you know this, Tom, but I'll explain to your, to your audience. You know, Alvarado has four bonefish tournaments. So there's the fall all tackle, which I believe is November. Same with the fall fly. Now the fall all tackle allows um, fly. You get more points for using fly fishing gear if you catch the fish on it. Fly, um, spinning gear, bait, um, jigs. Um, you know, you can use a plug rod. Um, so that's the all tackle, all different gear. Then there's the fall fly, which is only fly gear. Then there's two in the spring. There's a the spring all tackle which again, you use different gear in the spring fly, which is only, the fly is only fly fishing gear. So the 
you know, the um, the fall fly started in 1968. Mm -hmm. So these tournaments have been going on a really long time, and they're a great data source because they really, I, they pretty much, they all started on Murata. They moved a spot a little bit, but they have very strict start time, start and stop times. So I know the effort. The effort is, um, in, essentially, hours fished. I know who the anglers were. I know from the points I could determine was that fish caught on fly, was it caught on um, and spinning gear, was it caught on bait? So it was a great data set to analyze. So my first step was to look at what were the most significant factors that contributed to these to the catch rates. And then you can remove them mathematically to really focus in on what is the true index of abundance. So these are the variables that I looked at. Okay, so first I analyzed it two different ways. Um, one way was to see if a bonefish was caught, yes or no. That's a, a binary distribution. So no bonefish were caught on that, on that trip, it's a zero. If a bonefish was caught in that trip, it's a one. Um, and then another way I analyzed it was when a bonefish was caught, what were the variables that contributed to how many were caught? Like, okay, so here's a trip where a bonefish was caught. And that trip, did they catch one? Did they catch two? Did they catch three? So I analyzed it that way. And I had over 1,262 trips resulted in over 4,886 bonefish. So I had a huge mess of data to work with. Wow. Now to get back to the, um, the variables. So the variables I looked at were tackle. Like, you know, was it was a fly? Was it was a spin? Was it um, also a plug rod using a, um, a jig or so forth? Um, how was it caught? Season, was it the spring or fly? Angler experience. So the way I did angler experience is I knew the names. Angler experience is how many times did they have they fished in that tournament? Like 10 years in, like um, Captain A, he fished 10 years in. I could see, determine how many times when they caught that fish for that on that trip, how many times have they fished that tournament before? Was it their first year or was it their 10th year, their 15th year? So that's how I looked at angler experience. I did the same thing with guide experience. I knew how many times, you know, Captain A fished. So I have anger A and Captain B. How many times did that guide experience, how many times did he fish in these tournaments? So the first time they'd be a one, the second time they fish one of these tournaments, they get two and so forth. And then team experience, how many times did that anger and that guide fish together on the same exact trip? <laughs> and then I was able, I interviewed a bunch of participants to find some additional variables. So I was able to look at moon phase, uh, you know, full moon, uh, all the different waxing gibbons and all that stuff. Uh, tide was a primary when they fished that day. Was it a primary rising tide or a falling tide? Wind, I just looked at, was it 20 knots or higher, 20 knots higher, or, or 20 knots below, above 20 knots or below 20 knots? And cloud cover, believe it or not, the, the Marathon Airport, which is not that far from um, mm -hmm. Marata, they actually had, they had a daily estimate of cloud cover. So it was just a great data set that I was able to analyze with it. So I so I analyzed, I guess, to go on to the, the first analysis for now that all those different variables, I can explain them again if I if I did if you don't get them all, Tom. But um if so the first analysis, if a bonefish was caught on a trip, yes or not. There was there was two variables that were some significant. And I'll make this interesting, Tom. If you want, we could bet like a week at Hawk's Hair or something. If you get, <laughs> if I, if you get wrong, I get to go for a week. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, the uh, so what do you think? The, the I'm going to put you on the spot here. What do you think the um, – there, there were two that were significant. Only two that were significant for whether a bonefish was caught on a trip. So I analyzed using all those variables. So whether – so it was a zero, no fish, or – or one, if it had a fish that was caught, was so whether a bonefish was caught or not, which variables do you think were the most significant? I would have to say weather. Weather of some sort. So maybe not cloud cover, but wind, wind or cloud cover, I would say. Did you read my dissertation? <laughs> no, but <laughs> but I've fished in the Keys for a long time, and it's when it's windy and cloudy, we don't catch as much. I can tell you that. <laughs> yeah, my, my dissertation is available online, but I know you didn't know. I think like 12 people read it. So anyway, <laughs> but, uh, but you're right. You're right. The number one variable was, um, so I knew you weren't one of the 12. I think my dad was the other 11 <laughs> and I was number 12. But anyway, um, but yeah, so you're right. Number one variable for whether bonefish was caught or not was wind. If the wind was greater than 20 knots, then the, the cat, that there was a lot more zeros than ones. So you're right. 
And then the second, there was only one other one that was, that was um, whether Bone Fisher was caught or not. You know what the second one was? If you don't know, you can guess and I can tell you. Um, the second one of whether it was caught or not. Um, maybe tied. Nope. Okay. Angler experience. Oh, okay. So uh, and the, the number of times that they fished those tournaments. Yeah. So That's interesting because, though, you know, that's an interesting one. I think that it would be a, a bigger um, – difference in something like the red bone where you have you have some people that really aren't fishermen and they fish it once and they kind of are in the celebrity division or whatever like that but the fall yeah, fly yeah, the yeah. spring fly the the all tackle i mean typically if you're in that tournament you're pretty serious i mean those are there you're you don't have a lot of casual anglers but still between the 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 Mark Crocas of the world and the Mitch Howells of the world and the Andy Mills and the and 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 the people that win these tournaments all the time, um, and and the other guys that have never won. There's a significant difference in in effectiveness and and success. You do you do find an interesting uh, caveat to this data. You're right. This is just. Right. I don't think it's even that much money. It's maybe two hundred dollars to fish this tournament with the red bone is more expensive. But you're right. This is just serious bonefish yeah anglers. like you're not gonna much. be a novice but then also yeah, yeah. another interesting thing that you analyze there is team you know the the teams because i mean you'll get some teams in in these things you know you get the 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 you know the um tim hoover jim bocar you get the you get those type of teams the harry spears and the steve huffs when they're fishing with their best people and they're you have these teams that just stay together for years and they just dominate you know there there's something about yeah, the the, yeah. the 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 chemistry there that it's great and 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 when you see it, and sometimes those teams will break up and neither the guide or the angler with another guide will do as well as they did together it's it's pretty cool to to watch <laughs> yeah but anyway so uh, <laughs> but it's but the point out you know another thing interesting is this the variables for whether bonefish was caught or not that were not significant like I thought for sure, uh, gear was a factor, but it looks like whether bonefish or not, the fly guys are just as, as good at putting a fish in the boat. Now they whether they catch more bonefish or not, we'll get into that in the next analysis. But but um, they're just as good at getting you know a, a fish in a boat as the as the, the bait guys for these tournaments, mm -hmm. for these tournaments. And then um, you know the fact that um, angler experience was um, the second most. This, it was just these two variables that were relevant um, since angler experience was was significant. I always joke that, you know, especially you as a guide, like if, if you, if, so keep that in mind, if you go out and you go fishing with a guide, if you don't catch anything, don't blame the guide, blame yourself, <laughs> right? I mean, that's the variable, whether you have to catch a bonefish or not, it's on you, you know, not the guide, it's on you. So sometimes, then, um... <laughs> sometimes, and other times, you know, how are you going to catch them if you never saw one all day? Um, so yeah, 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 that. true, true, true. So now to get into the second part, so on those trips when a bonefish was caught, you know, I analyzed whether they caught one, two, three, four, or more um, bonefish or not. So just those trips. And I had actually four variables that were significant there. So um, you want to you take a guess what those are? Um, whether it was... Um, yeah, the numbers of fish caught. So the difference between... Caught. Yeah, so the difference between a trip that caught one bonefish and a trip that caught 10 bonefish. What were the variables that made that... Again, why I'm going to say weather. I'm going to say weather. It's gonna be it's gonna be wind. You know probably. that didn't that didn't come out for the, for didn't. this that that was clear for whether bonefish was caught or not. Mm -hmm. But maybe um but for these tackle was the biggest one. So oh, okay. actually the yeah. the the bait the bait guy which makes sense um they're catching more fish on a trip than the fly guy. So for we sure. have trips. Yeah, yeah yeah which makes now makes now another sense. interesting thing that I don't know if you thought about this but when you're when you're analyzing bait versus fly you're only having two tournaments where baits allowed but fly is allowed in all four of these tournaments which is yeah. kind of interesting but some of the fly guys are going to only you know try to catch like one fish on fly and then they're going to go straight back to the bait so that you can catch more points or or whatever but yeah there is zero question that you're going to catch more with with bait yeah, 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 yeah. And then second one was guide experience. That was the most. So the guys that fished the tournaments more had the had more of the trips where they caught four, five, eight, nine, ten more bonefish. So the the number of times that they fished those tournaments that was was guide experience. It's not luck. And what's 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then another thing I was surprised was bone phase. Hmm. So there was um, most bone for the number of bonefish caught. There was more bonefish caught in those trips around a full moon. The fewest hmm. number of bonefish were caught on a new moon. So this one definitely surprised me that. Um, but maybe the you know at night they they're more active during a full moon. You know, I would almost say that that would be associated with the tide flow more than than the the whether they're feeding at night or anything like that, that on a full moon, you're going to have bigger tides, more, more tide flow, more current, more, more tide fluctuation than you are on, on a, on a new moon. Right. Wouldn't you agree with that? Gotcha, gotcha. And, yeah. Yeah. And I typically, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, if you get yeah, some really yeah. good teams and really good guides out there, when you've got really good tides and the, and the weather's good, you're going to see a lot of fish being caught. Yeah. Yeah. But then the fourth one and the last one was anger experience. Mm -hmm. So I actually I so the 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 anger slash guide um, experience that did not come up significant. Mm -hmm. So I guide was very the guide was very experienced a number of times of the guides fish and the anger experience was very important. But the two of them together, which I know we talk I know it's definitely dynamic, right? I mean, especially if you fish with someone you know how to which I would maybe because they switch around a lot, there wasn't a lot of data, or I don't know, or or, but I was surprised at that too, because I know, you know, you fish with someone, like I fish with my friend, Captain Bobby Gibson a lot, but we know, you know, like where his, you know, when he says 50 feet at three o'clock, I know where he's talking about, right, you know, right. where someone else may be like, oh, I, you got to learn fishing with them. So, but that's just the data that I got hmm. from that. That's super okay. interesting though, from all those tournaments. I mean, that's a lot of data. How long did it take yeah. you to, to put that all, put that all in and then assimilate it and, and come up with with the stats that you just told us. Yeah. I think it was like, well, the analysis took a week, but the getting the data took years. Yeah. I mean, like, oh, I'll call this person. I think it's a data sheet. Oh, I'll go this one. He's got it. So just trying to get it, you know, and there were gaps too. I do have data going back to 1968, but there were, and there were some hurricanes where they canceled it and stuff like that. They, they, the keys just never recovered in time for the, the habit. And, and there were some where I just didn't have the data sheet. But majority of them for those four tournaments I had most of their since they started I had most of them. Yeah. So it was a great, great data set to analyze. So, so you want to get into the um, the population of the absolutely. Keys? Yeah. Well, I guess first, so you want to get into that first, or get into the the size of bonefish a little more. Whatever, the, man. I'm interested in both of them, size and numbers. Okay. I like I like you, to catch both. I like to catch uh, lots <laughs> lots of big ones. <laughs> So, so I actually, I, I finished up in 2010. So all my analysis stopped in 2010. And also, but I included data for that, that in 2010, we had that huge uh, cold kill mm -hmm. back then. So I, but you know, beyond that, I really can't tell, cause actually that I moved, got a job with fit and fisheries management, moved on, but anyway, um, but to go back to what, it, you know, when I analyzed, um, and I also knew for another one of these tournaments was, I knew the, I didn't know all the weights. But I knew what's called a weigh fish. So mm -hmm. those tournaments we just talked about, if it's eight pounds or bigger, they bring it in and they weigh it on a certified scale. And and then I, I actually for the spring fly for many years, I was a weigh master, you know, there checking the fish for tags and weighing it. So, but it's another great data set because you look at the the size of these fish caught over time. So when I looked in the literature, there's three primary factors that contribute to the size of the bone, size of fish in a, in a population. And there's, there's even a book on this famous fishery biologist, Daniel Polly wrote on it. But so the three factors and, and people have asked me, like, does that apply to deer or, or, or you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know about terrestrial animals at all. But anyway, the, but the for fish, the three factors are mortality. So the higher the fishing mortality rate, you're really you're fishing them out. So they're dying before they get to those, those older age classes. And, and diet's another one. We talked about how they switched over the ones in the Florida Keys, switch over to uh, fish. They switch over to mm -hmm. toadfish. And temperature is another one. So this this book on on fish size really goes into detail about temperature. So fish are larger on in our case in in the northern hemisphere. They're larger in the northern end of the range because the water's a little bit colder. And there's actually the colder the water, the higher the oxygen. And they don't they don't have to extract as much energy to extract that that oxygen from the water. Hmm. So it goes into real details of the physiology. That's but super interesting. That was going to be one of the questions I asked you because that's just from observation. I've noticed that fish are larger in the northernmost portion of their range. And as you go south, especially with bonefish, they get more plentiful but smaller as you go yeah. further yeah, and further yeah, yeah, and further yeah, yeah, south. Yeah. That's That seems to hold yeah. true. And I didn't know if that was just 
a lucky observation or if there was actually something to it. Sounds like sounds like something to it. So we're lucky in the Keys. I feel like we're in, we have we have two you know benefits right there. We have the diet where they you know they boost up their size from eating fish, and we're at the northern end of the Albio Volpes range. I know there's occasions where they get them off off Rhode Island and stuff like that, but that's extremely rare, you know. So mm -hmm. so we have a uh, kind of those things going for us: the diet and the temperature. And but you know so looking at so the third thing mortality. So when I analyze and I get into this to my dissertation, I use different uh, population models, but so, but you go back to the size of bonefish, like if you go all the way back to Zane Gray, like he was, I read some of his work, he bragged about getting a, a 10 pound bonefish, but that was 1910, you know? So, I mean, he, he was like, this is the biggest bonefish ever, but you have to really go back to 1910 and you go back then and the mortality was, fishing mortality was, was huge. Hmm. I mean, you know, back then you catch a bonefish, it's not going back in the water, right? right? I don't think catch and release, they knew what catch and release was. And really, until the late '70s, before then, it was it was all um, catch and kill, not catch and release. So that was a big factor. You can kind of see after the '70s, once they like catch and release started to kick in in the '70s, and from that tournament day, you can see the size of bonefish slowly bump up, slowly bump up. So the significant, but another significant factor that contributed to the size of bonefish when I analyzed this was the mullet fishing in the Keys. Now I don't know if there's much mullet. We had the you know the net ban in 1995 and all that, but but before that, in 1978, they made the first a very strict regulation on the size and number of mullet nets you can use in the Florida Keys. So, but, and there's there's documented um, examples where they were getting mullet and bonefish at the same time. Mm -hmm. So once they, so once you stop killing those those bonefish from those big mullet nets they had back in the 70s in the Keys, then you can see the size bump up even more. In fact, 1982 was the first ever 13 pound bonefish was reported in the Florida Keys. So you can kind of see this trend here as you as you decrease the mortality rate, the size of these fish are creeping up more and more. And then in the, in the, in the 80s, you get, um, and then in the, in the 90s, you get these 14 and 15 pound bone fish, and even, even on in the 2000s. So I did a, um, a simulation here. I'm gonna share my screen in a second. Let me find this here. So this is one of the figures from my dissertation here. Let me, um, give me one second here. Let me share my screen. Um, so one of the models I looked at was doing a simulation. If so, I could estimate the mortality in the fishery from looking at the the size of fish, the numbers of fish at different size, and I got that from the tagging. I knew the length of the fish, and then from there you convert lengths to to ages and so forth. So so what I'm trying to show you here, this is and this is really where were we in 2010? So fork length, and I'm sorry, this is straight by dissertation. It's in it's in millimeters here on the the x-axis. And then the frequency of those fish is on the y-axis. But what, what I found in this simulation, okay, so where, where were we? So that, that dashed line was where we were in 2010. The, the dotted line is where you don't want to be. So we were actually in 2010 because there was some fish mortality in the fishery. And then the big fish kill from the, from the cold freeze, we were pretty down, down close. But these, I know it's hard to read, but these were kind of like the, I'm showing them my, my, um, with my mouse here, it's kind of the, the older, like the the 12 and 13 and 14 pound fish. So, but if you if you remove that fishing mortality, which I know we're never gonna have zero fishing mortality rate, but if you remove that, you know, look how the population changes. You have a lot more fish. Those those bigger age, bigger fish in the fishery. So the point I'm trying to make: if you decrease fishing mortality rate, you will get you'll get much bigger fish in the fishery. Hmm. And that's why um, I think I think the future looks bright for bonefish. Because um, take a quick story, I was on um, Seas's Creek back in the 2000s, and I always had a, on um, on the boat. I always had a um, binoculars. So I remember I was I'm not gonna say the name who it was, but um, I'm on the east side, and and this person was fishing on the west side, and there's a channel in the middle. So I remember they were all excited. They they caught a big bonefish. I, I staked up the boat. I grabbed um, binoculars, and I and I set my stopwatch. And I watched, and that fish came out of the water. It was out of the water for six minutes. Wow. I mean, I get it. This person caught a, a I think it was like a 12 pound bonefish. They're really excited, you know. And then the research which Catch and Release shows if you keep them out of the water for a minute or longer, they have a 70% chance at dying. So, but, but nowadays, I'm saying the future looks bright because I watch these fishing shows now, and people barely even take bonefish out of the water now. I mean, they keep them right in the water. They take the, they, you know, they, they, they just pop the hook right out. Or back when, when I was doing it in the 2000s, you know, we had a research boat. We'd catch the fish, 
put him in a giant core with with an aerator, and then we get out the camera and all that. But back in the 2000s, you know, I mean, now we have we have a camera in our pocket, right? Mm-hmm. With our phone, we have a camera right on us. Where I remember, you know, watching these people back in the 2000s, they catch a big fish, they put it on the deck, you know, then they're scrambling. Okay, where's my camera? Where'd I put my camera? Okay, I want a shot. Hold on, I want one more shot. Let me get a shot with a rod in the photo, you know. So I think in it, when I was involved with the fishery mortality rate it was about 10 percent. so the fishing mortality rate there's always a natural mortality rate like dolphins and goliath grouper and sharks whatever but i had about just from fishing mortality rate I estimated about translated to about 10 percent of the bonefish that were caught with hook and line were dead now they may not be dead when you release them but they're dead within within 24 hours mm-hmm. so even though it could swim away that doesn't mean it's alive tomorrow especially if you leave it out of the water for six minutes it could flop away but that doesn't mean it's gonna be it's gonna be there tomorrow so i i think the future looks bright because i think the fish mortality rate is much much lower uh people are so much better at keeping the fish in the water you know it's like they're they're afraid to touch them now on tv shows which mm-hmm. i think is phenomenal you right. know um keep them in the water let them breathe you know so so i think things things look bright but and i think another topic you want to um oh yeah one more thing so when i did this analysis so um, when I analyze the catch rate, so people might not want to hear this, but but since the late 90s, the bonefish population was declining since the late 90s. There was still bonefish around, don't get me wrong, but it was declining. And there was a, a there was certainly a source of fishing mortality rate since the late 90s. And then you have the 2010 fish kill, the really um, cold, cold weather, you know, and and that really, you know, knocked it down even further. So you're knocking out age classes. So the population was slowly declining in any of the fish kill, but but this analysis stopped in 2010, and I think if we analyze it now, I think we'd see a much more rosy picture, a much better mm. better picture. But you know, and I know you fished the lower keys, and what's interesting about that that fish kill, because um, um, one of my colleagues, Jing and Lu, he did an intensive analysis of the um, during that that 2010 that cold weather. Where was it? So he grabbed all the data from the different weather stations. And that water was cold, but it really didn't get down the lower keys. Like that really, really cold water was like Amarada, Key Largo, yeah. Biscayne Bay. But beyond that, I mean, I don't know if you saw it down there, but it looked like beyond Marathon, they were fine. Like the water just didn't dip down that yeah. cold as it did in Florida Bay and Biscayne Bay. So yeah. the, the upper keys took a big hit then, but I think the lower keys was okay. Yeah, it was definitely better. There were there were some hits there. The Goliath grouper certainly were affected. You know, a lot of the fish that couldn't, you know that don't you know they're under the mangroves or whatever and they didn't leave they didn't do well um and there was a noticeable change in that but the bone fishing in the lower keys right now is the best it's ever been in my in my lifetime um and it's it's really amazing i mean it is getting better every time i go out there it's better it's amazing so those i mean i don't know if that's what it was but it wasn't long after that that it started getting better and better and better and better and better in the lower keys and now you know when i first showed up in key west the bone fishing was not good we never saw fish like they see now and those guys are they are on them every day and and there are plenty of them there's a lot of them it's really really optimistic down there for the bone fish population which makes me I mean, but what makes me wonder, because what I've seen, the really driver in the bonefish population is fishing mortality. So I wonder if something changed in the in the lower keys with they... Um... Maybe. If, if it did, it would be on a large scale, like a netting operation or something. Yeah, yeah, sort of Some sort of something like, you know, there, there's just... I, I, everybody's catch and release, you, you know, as far as the, the flats guides that are fishing for bonefish, there's very, I, I would think, very few, if uh, no one, keeps bonefish and and they haven't it's not like something changed in the 90s and and everybody's decided not to kill them anymore i don't think i've i've only seen um one offshore guide bring in bonefish where he caught them in about 100 feet of water and he brought them right in and cleaned them and um, those are the only bonefish i've ever seen on a on a fillet table um so it's not like people kill them but there could be some sort of a change in a in a large scale operation somewhere else or even even in a different country like maybe it's from mexico or maybe it's from cuba or maybe it's from something else that who knows they they didn't net for a couple of years or they moved the operation or something and yeah, allowed yeah, yeah, yeah. allowed this stock yeah. to come in um but something changed and and it's 
I welcome the change because it's the best it's ever been. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so my last topic, which um I want to talk about, is the Amarada, the big bonefish of Amarada. Yeah. And then if you have any questions at the end, but I'll be happy to talk about. It. Well, my 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 take on the Amarada, the big bonefish of Amarada. So, so this is what what I take from just um I guess from sitting in my office and analyzing the tag data, analyzing all the data I have. So, so here's what I, I don't. So I don't think there's, in my mind, from what I've seen the data, I just don't think there's an Amarada bonefish. Like meaning we've had we've had bonefish in Biscayne Bay go down to Amarada. We've had bonefish in Amarada go up to Biscayne Bay. So they're mixing back and forth. But there's a there's a, a catch to that. So um, what to give you an example? So back in like one of the it was in August where I caught a 10 pound bonefish in Biscayne Bay right at Sands Cut and I tagged it and released it. That fish went on to be recaptured in the um, the, uh, the the fall fly. I think it was like November, and that fish I was okay. So I I weighed it. So and we give that real quick. So I didn't. So I do bogo grip, but I I had a we had a really soft net that we would actually weigh the fish in the net and then and then and then subtract the the weight of the net. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't actually bogo gripping the lip of the fish. But anyway, that ten pound fish where I weighed on a on a scale and then it went on to be recaptured you know, months later in Amarada, and it was 12 pounds. And I watched it on the, on the scale, on a certified canoe scale that they have for that tournament. So here's what's going on in, in Amarada. So I think what they're, those tournaments are also during the spawning season. So they're actually, they're spawning, they're, they're full up with row. Like that, yeah, I think it was like the 16 um, pound class ticket for IGFA back in 2009. I had that fish given to me. So this was a, a world record IGFA bonefish that was it died in the process of of weighing it, and it and but it was given to me. So I after they you know did the weight and all that, so I aged it. It was a teenager, I think it was like 18 years old, but but that fish which was a, it was like 15 pounds and like six ounces or eight ounces, um, but anyway, so it wasn't the longest bonefish. It was like 28 inches, but it was full of roe. So there was a female full of roe. It also had a pretty um, full belly of, of food as well. So I think what they're capturing in these tournaments, and keep in mind, now there are a lot of Amarada, but a lot of those tournaments, they run up to the skiing bay as well. But I think they're just getting those fish during their spawning season. They're getting those, even the males will fill up with milk, but those females will really get real heavy. I mean, they could get up to 20% gain in weight hmm. from from the row and they're, from, their, from their gonads developing. So therefore, I, I think that's what they're capturing. And, and I think... You know Peterson Bank and, and downtown Amarada. I w- I think near there there's a spawning um there's a spawning location for these fish. I do. I think and I think they're just getting them pre spawn or between spawns. That's what I think is going on with those Amarada big bone fish. Because I mean I'm I'm catching the same exact. I gave an example. I caught the same exact fish in Biscayne Bay at Sands Cut that they caught in a in a downtown Amarada. I think they caught it like at Peterson Bank or that Swash or whatever it's called. Mm-hmm. So it was like you know a downtown Amarada bonefish. And here I was, I, t- I caught it back in August. So it's the same fish. And I fished Pearson Bank back there in the summertime. You know, there, there was big fish back there. They didn't have the weight, but they still had the length. Mm-hmm. So I guess the point I'm making that I've seen from the tag data, there's not, you know, there's like a, people talk about it as if there's like a fence around Amarada, downtown Amarada, and those fish are always there. Well, they move back and forth. And also when they're spawning, they gain a lot of weight as well. So that's another and you know, fishermen always talk about weight, which I don't, I don't blame them. You know, they don't really focus. All these bonefish guys, they don't really focus on the length too much. But wait, 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 because mm-hmm. you want to yeah. capture, you know, the, the it's a three dimensional object. The length only does one dimension. So you want to know capture the full the weight, the length, and give the girth. You know, the so I understand why they're collecting. The That's weight. interesting. And then going back to what you said before about the the thousands of bonefish that you that you tagged and then were recaptured, forty percent were on the same flat. And if you, I I, w- I would venture to bet that that if you were to tag back in those same days on Shell Key, um, that it would be even higher because it looked like the same fish all the time, just giant yeah. ones, yeah. giant ones just swimming around out there. And and um, I think that they just, I don't know if that's where, th- that's where they like to feed. I don't know if that's where they lived all the time. They probably yeah, they yeah, moved gotcha. all yeah, around. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. but, you know, when you in those days, if you went to Shell Key, I mean, the only reason that you didn't go to Shell Key was because you didn't think that you had an angler that was capable of catching them. But if well, you thought you had, there, right? right, yeah. But if you thought you had a good angler, I mean, that's why wouldn't you go there? That's where the giant ones were. And, you know, or the tide wasn't right or something. But if the tide was right yeah. and you had the angler, yeah, yeah. of course, if you didn't have the angler, there was no reason to go there because 
I mean, those fish were super, super, super tough. And, and it, it took somebody that understood what was going on and could follow directions and, and also had a little luck on their, on their, on their side, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, to catch those really big ones. You know, I think about the big fish. So you, know, you talked about earlier how they have a small mouth. Like you go to um, in the Bahamas, these small bonefish, even though I've seen some in Biscayne Bay, like they're extremely aggressive. I think when they're a small bonefish, they have to be. Mm-hmm. Like they have such a small, their mouth is like the size of a dime. Like they have such a limited food they need to eat. And there's such limited food that they can actually eat. Whereas you get a big bonefish, you know, a big 10 pound, 12 pound, he has a much, much bigger gape. So now I can, I can eat toadfish. I can, like you can be more selective. You know, where I, I fight those little guys. I mean, they'll chase it up on the surface. Like, it's a food item. They freak out. Like, they, they might not see another food item all day or all week, you know. Right. Whereas the big guys can be much more. I mean, fish can certainly learn. We've seen that in, in many different research. But they, I think those big guys can be selective. Like, I don't have to chase that toadfish. I can eat this. I can eat that, you know. What, what more diverse prey? Whereas the little guys, they're such limited by their small amount. It's not like they can bite off a chunk and eat it, right? They have to suck it in. And then, and I don't think I talked about it. It's fascinating. If you ever catch a bonefish, look at their tongue. They have teeth on the roof of their, on their both yeah. on the roof of their mouth and on their tongue. And in my office, I have a collection of, from the bonefish I ate, is I have a collection of their, their tongues. <laughs> I know it sounds creepy, but whenever I talk to my kids' um, school, I'm always like, this is a, a part of a bonefish. What part is it from? And I pass around the bonefish tongue. No one ever gets it right because it's just, but when you realize it's a tongue, like, oh, yeah, it's got little teeth on it. And, and it's, and, my kids think I should make a necklace of it, but I think it'd be really creepy if I did that. But, <laughs> but anyway, but some of those tongues get pretty big, like those big, big bonefish, yeah. you know, the small ones are small, but it's really kind of neat. If you ever catch one look in their mouth, you know, and you can see how they, they crush that prey with the roof of their mouth and, and their tongue. Well, I'll so. do that. I intend to catch one and catch more. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, well, I, I, this has been amazing. All, all kinds of great data. So with all the, with all the data that you have, I want to end it with this, with all the data that you have, with all the fishermen that you've talked to, with all the um, things that, that you have collected over the years, do you see something that is a very common thing that, that fishermen or guides kind of struggle with that seems really obvious to you about catching bonefish or finding bonefish? I think what you said earlier, which I started doing too, um, you know, even though you don't see them, that doesn't mean they're not there, right? And you said, you were talking about Mitch Howell, like he had this blind, blind cast, you know, and I started getting that a lot more, you know, especially if it's cloudy, just blind cast, blind cast a jug, uh, excuse me, a jig, because this, because you don't see him, maybe, maybe they don't, don't see him, especially those little guys. Like my son caught his first bone, but we never even saw it, just, just casting. Like I knew we, we lost him, but just cast, just blind cast. And uh, I think that's the biggest thing. Right on. And I also want to end it, you know, the few, I think the, the future looks bright. I think fish mortality, if I was going to do that research again today, it would be much, much lower from what I see on TV shows and Instagram. If you hold a bonefish up on Instagram with their hand in the gills, like people are going to, they're going to tar and feather you, I feel like. I mean, <laughs> you get criticized quite heavily for that. Whereas back in the when I was doing it, like that was the norm. That's just what you did. So I think it's, um, it's much, and I was fortunate just, a couple weeks ago, I had a, a little break, went down to Key Biscayne and walked there with my niece and we saw a school of bonefish right there. And she caught her first ever bonefish, my niece from Pennsylvania. So I think there's still bonefish around. So, and I still, my heart is always going to be in the Florida Keys. I still think that is the best area. If you want big bonefish, um, I guess Seychelles has big ones too, as we talked about. But I mean, without traveling around the globe, I think the Keys is just, I mean, if you want big bonefish, that's where to go. It's a great fishery and we're very lucky to have it. Yeah, we certainly are. And uh, thanks to scientists like you that have given us a lot of data and, and all that information offers a, a, a more, more knowledge and, and ways to protect these fish, uh, protect their spawning grounds, protect the water quality, protect everything. And, and hopefully, you know, we'll be able to take our grandchildren out there and catch, catch all these fish. But, you, you know, if you start from the lower keys and work your way up, it's getting better and better and better every single day. Um, good. It, good. It's good. really looks bright. Yeah, we <laughs> need to get you down there to fish because you the the numbers are astounding. I mean, Bahamas numbers, like I it's really, know. really, really good. So that's why I want to retire. Place, I mean, hang in there. Yeah. I don't know when, but I'm I definitely want to retire. Hey, there. me I too. My wife. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to retire too. It's going to be another another long time. But anyway, well, Mike, thanks so much, man. This has been fantastic. So everything you wanted to know about bonefish and more, probably. 
that's going to be the name of the of this of the title of this and and you you came through man you gave us all kinds of information it's really really super interesting and for for people that that like bonefish they are one that you can you know they're they're a little mysterious especially when you think they're going to be there and they're not and you're just kind of curious about the fish and about you know the more you fish for them the more you like them and the more you like them the more you want to know about them so thanks for thanks for all that information i really appreciate it and uh you know follow mike he you're not a big social guy what do, what do they do yeah. what do they want to know what if they want to know more about you i guess if they have questions if they want to email me it's elopomorph at gmail.com it's e-l-o-p-o-m-o-r-p-h that's elopomorph at gmail.com so if you, you go and email me and i'm happy to answer questions if i know the answer but i'll try <laughs> all right all right man well that's great thank you so much and we'll be back next week with another awesome guest here we go see you